functions, create, list, date, delete, apply, get product function. So if I grab my API URL now, you copy that, and if I flick over to Safari, to window, and let's actually hit our API endpoint now. And remember the endpoint we want is tools and migrate, and that's returned okay. So our API our database has been set up now. So let's go and have a look at some of our endpoints. If I hit my list products endpoint, there we are, I get no products. <music> Hello everyone and welcome to another video on modernizing your .NET applications to run on AWS serverless compute. In this video, we're going to take our ASP.NET API that we've been developing over the last few videos and we're going to split that down into single purpose handlers. Instead of having ASP.NET running within Lambda, we're going to have a separate Lambda function per endpoint in our application. Now, you might be wondering why you want to do that. And there's a couple of reasons, really. One of the benefits of doing that is that you can then scale both your memory and your permissions independently for each function. So let's say that your create endpoint on your API needs a lot more memory. Well, running ASP.NET in its entirety in Lambda means that every single endpoint in your API needs to have the same permissions, the same resource allocation. Splitting things out into separate functions allows you to control that memory allocation independently. So you can give your really resource hungry endpoint lots of memory, but maybe your other endpoints that need less memory can be given less memory. That will cost you less. Let's have a look at how we would do that. If we remember we have our product controller, from the last video that's using entity framework to both list and create products in a SQL Server database. And in the startup class of our API, we're pulling the credential information from AWS Secrets Manager and we're storing our, our credentials there secure. Now, if we want to start to move that to separate Lambda functions, I'm actually going to use a NuGet package that's in preview currently with from AWS, which is called the Lambda Annotations Framework. If I just open up my project file here, you see I've got the Amazon.Lambda.Annotations and it's version 0.13. Currently in the Lambda Annotations Framework, add some really useful annotations and attributes we can use to really quickly build out APIs using Lambda. And the first thing that's really interesting with the annotations framework is that I can still keep my startup class regardless of the fact that I'm no longer using ASP.NET. And what I can do is I can annotate my startup class with this Lambda startup attribute. That Lambda startup comes from the Amazon Lambda annotations. You'll need to make sure you add that namespace. And then within that startup class, I can have a method called configure services the same way we always have configured services in ASP.NET. And you see this code in here for configuring my services is exactly the same code that I had in my ASP.NET startup class. There's some slight changes around instead of pulling information from my configuration, from my app settings file, I'm no longer doing that. I'm simply just using environment variables all the time because I don't actually have an app settings file anymore. I could. I could manually parse an app settings file into the I configuration object, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to use environment variables. My startup class is exactly the same. If we have a look at this file called function.cs now, this is my actual API. This could be compared to my controller in ASP.NET. And if we scroll up here, you can see that my Constructor is the same as it was. I'm injecting my data context as part of my constructor. I'm using dependency injection. That hasn't changed. And then I actually get to the Lambda functions themselves. Now, I'll pop a video in the description to the a video in my AWS SAM playlist in terms of how to build Lambda functions with .NET. And there can be a lot of when you're building Lambda functions with .NET, especially if you're parsing out API requests because you need to manually parse the body, you need to manually check that the path parameters exist, for example. What the Lambda Annotations Framework gives us is these two attributes at the top here. And this tells 
the compiler to use source generators to actually generate all of that additional code that's required to parse the API gateway request on our behalf. So what we're defining here is a really simple list products endpoint. It's going to be on the root of our API. So there's no path parameters required. Therefore, my method doesn't have any parameters. And then my Lambda function can focus purely on the business logic of my Lambda function, much like you would in ASP.NET. You don't need to worry about or is in the HTTP request, the framework does that for you. And that's what annotations framework is aiming to address. So you see my list products endpoint, if I go back over to my controller and we have a look at that over here, there, I've just got list my products from the DB data context, and then I'm returning an okay response. If we look at my function code, I'm listing from my data context and I'm just returning my list of products. I've got a couple of other lines here for logging and for tracing. This is actually using Lambda Power Tools for .NET. I'll put a link for the description for that if you're interested. And the same happens when we look at our post request. So we look at our create product endpoint. And you see, we've just got this from body attribute. Again, this from body attribute comes from the Amazon Lambda annotations framework. And this will now tell the framework to deserialize our body of our API request and parse that into product DTO object. Again, if I flip back to my controller, we look at our create endpoint, it is literally the same code, apart from the fact I've got some additional logging lines in here. It makes it really, really easy with the annotations framework to move your APIs from these running ASP.NET within Lambda to these single purpose Lambda functions. And one of the really important things with these attributes is this HTTP API attribute. So there's a few different attributes we have as part of this. We have REST APIs, we have HTTP APIs, and that's because the payload that comes in from API Gateway is different based if you're using HTTP APIs or you're using REST APIs. We're going to put a HTTP API in front of this, which means we need to use the HTTP API attribute. I've got a few other endpoints that I've added in here for getting a specific product. And you see, I've got my ID path parameter and I've got an int of ID in my actual function code. I've also got an update and a delete endpoint. So it's a pretty standard CRUD API. And if I build this now, this will compile successfully. If I go to my web single purpose and hit build, that has now successfully built that application and what's actually happened there is annotations framework has used the feature of .NET called source generators and it has generated at compile time all of the code required to do that mapping from the payload that comes in from API gateway to the payload required in our Lambda. What this means is that our function handler strings need to change slightly. So if I open up my AWS SAM template now, Previously, this was just a single, if we go and have a look at our web API.NET 6, and we have a look at our template.yaml, this is the SAM template for running ASP.NET on Lambda. And you see our code URI is just the current folder because we are compiling the code from our current folder. And we've got that function handler async method that comes from our Lambda entry point class. And then actually our API specification at the bottom here we have just got a single path on our API, which is slash proxy, and we're going to take any method. And remember, ASP.NET now is handling the routing for this Lambda function. But what we're trying to do today is we're trying to set up separate Lambda functions for each of our individual API endpoints. And what this means now is we've got a lot more resources in our SAM template. So you see we've got our five API endpoints, and then we've got the separate endpoint for applying the database migrations. I've actually moved some of the configuration logic here from my specific resource up into this global section at the top of my SAM template. And that allows me to apply the same configuration for all of my Lambda functions. The timeout, whether to activate tracing, the runtime, the architecture, these things are likely to be the same across every single function. And then I'm saying as a, I want to give a gigabyte of memory, but we can then go and override that the specific function level. When it gets to the specific functions now, remember all of our code is under the source web API.single purpose folder. 
And if we look at all of our lambda functions, they will all have that similar cod URI there. But what's interesting, however, is our handler string. So if we have a look at this handler string now, you see this is using some different class name than what we actually have in our class. So you see our class is just called function and the file function.cs in the webapi.singlepurpose namespace. However, our handler string here is webapi.singlepurpose and then function underscore list products underscore generated. Now what annotations framework will do is it will generate a new that will be suffixed with the name of the method. So you see we've got underscore list products and then underscore generated at the end. Whatever the name of your main class is, in this class function, whatever the name of your method name is with an underscore between and then generated on the end. And then the actual method to execute will always be the same name as the method that you actually have. In this case, list products. In the case of our create product endpoint, it's function underscore create product underscore generated. And then the method is called create product. And that same applies for all of our different resources in here. I've gone off and deployed this set of Lambda functions now using AWS SAM. And we see we've got our six Lambda functions, create, list, date, delete, apply, get product function. So if I grab my API URL now, copy that. And if I flick over to Safari, a window, and let's actually hit our API endpoint now. And remember the endpoint we want is tools and migrate and that's returned okay so our api our database has been set up now so let's go and have a look at some of our endpoints if i hit my list products endpoint there we are i get no products let's try and hit the slash one endpoint this is a cold start i remember we've got five separate lambda functions which means we've got five separate cold starts in essence that's returned no this is all looking positive like our api is working if i open up postman we can actually hit one of these endpoints and try and create a product so i just grab that url come into here paste that in there and we've got let's create a test product we're hitting our create endpoint now so we get cold start and there we've got id1 id2 id3 id4 so on and so forth let's just try for argument's sake hitting our list endpoint and there we now have our list of products so our api is up and functional using five separate lambda functions so what can we do now well let's have a look at our create product endpoint and let's say actually our create product endpoint needs a lot more memory i'm going to give three gig of memory to my create product function but actually my get product function is really lightweight so i'm going to scale that down to 512. What I'd actually advise doing in the real world is to run the AWS Lambda power tuning tool against your Lambda functions to get that bespoke memory allocation for each individual function that meets the price and performance requirements that you have in your specific scenario. I'll put a link in the description to Lambda power tuning so you can go off and have a look at that. The other thing we could actually do is we could actually create two separate sets of credentials in Secrets Manager. So of course, at the minute, we only have that single RDS DB secret. If I come back to the console and go to Secrets Manager, we've got this database secret that was generated by our CDK deploy. And this is our master user on our database that will have permissions to do everything possible against our database. What we could actually do is create a read secret and a write secret. And our get and our list endpoints could only ever get permissions to read from our database. And our create and put and delete endpoints might get permissions to write to our database and maybe not necessarily read. And we get really, really granular now. We talk at AWS about this principle of least privilege permissions. Splitting out the single purpose Lambda functions allows you to do that as opposed to giving each Lambda func every Lambda function the same memory allocation if you're using ASP.NET. So to quickly recap, we've taken our ASP.NET API and we've got the exact same startup class that we had in ASP.NET. In set, we've got this Lambda startup attribute that allows us to still use dependency injection without ASP.NET. 
We've then got our function.cs file that uses the Lambda annotations framework to build out these individual Lambda functions from our methods. And at compile time, this will use source generated C realization to actually generate the class and the method required to parse our HTTP API, API gateway request into this format that can be understood by this method. This is a really powerful way to start to move past ASP.NET, remove the overhead of starting up ASP.NET and build single purpose Lambda functions. As always, if you've liked this video, please like, please subscribe and please share. And I will see you next time.